Hey everyone, welcome back to the Real Women's Health Podcast. I'm Dr. Kristen Rojas, breast surgeon and GYN surgeon. And today I am so excited to have Dr. Alina Plume with us, who's going to talk to us about pregnancy do's and don'ts. Alina, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Kristen. It is a true honor. I am so proud of this show that you've made and I and blessed to be on it with you. Thank you for having me. Oh, I'm thrilled you're here. We've been trying to do this for so long. We were meaning to do it in person and then we had the pandemic and now the world is virtual. So here we are. Perfect. <laughs> so I want our audience to know just how special you really are. So Alina and I actually were not only co-residents at Brown University Women and Infants Hospital, but we were also roommates for like three years. Yeah, yeah. In our we, beautiful, cute little tiny Providence apartment. <laughs> yeah, and so we know everything about each other and Alina still loves me for better or for worse. I knew her back when she was Dr. Dot Kava and now she's Dr. Plume, so welcome. Thank you. So Dr. Plume, I want our listeners to know what a maternal fetal medicine specialist is. So why don't you tell us how you got this idea and what you do as an MFM doctor and what kind of patients you have? Absolutely. So it is a little bit confusing, I'll admit. So what um, after you do college and medical school, you do a residency, which is how you become a regular general doctor in some field. So that's when I did obstetrics and gynecology together with you at Brown. And then during that four-year residency, you can choose to remain in regular OBGYN or you can choose to specialize. And I was really interested in pregnancies and specifically women who have complicated pregnancies. So either something that's complicated about the mom's background health or if something that's wrong with the baby. And so if you're interested in that, you can go into a field called maternal fetal medicine. So maternal for the mom, fetal for the baby. And that is an extra three-year fellowship, which um, I completed at UCLA. And now I stayed on as faculty at UCLA as the maternal fetal medicine attending. So what you're saying is you had to do extra special training because you have not one, but two patients at a time. That's an excellent way of putting it. I, that's perfect. Yep. <laughs> and so now that you're a high risk OB to the stars, uh, what kind of problems do your patients have? So, you know, it's a full gamut. So something um, as minor as maybe being advanced maternal age, so even being above the age of 35 can technically qualify you as being high risk, which is practically 95% of my patients here on the West Coast. But, um, but then everything all the way as complex as somebody who's pregnant and has breast cancer, which you and I would co-manage together, for example. Um, some patients who maybe have lupus disorder or diabetes or high blood pressure, or if we find something um, abnormal in the baby, such as a genetic condition like Down syndrome, or maybe some um, birth defects in the heart or the bones or the liver, intestines, those kinds of things. Um, the other common thing I see is um, twins. So any kind of twins, triplets, multiple gestations, those patients are usually cared for by a maternal fetal medicine physician. Wow, that sounds like a very exciting job, but not one that I want to have. But I'm very glad that you're very good at it. You're nationally renowned with your recent publications too. I'm so, it's been so fun to see you like do your thing. Oh, I think you and I were good motivators for each other in residency, that's for sure. Yeah, that's probably true. Okay, so let's get down to it. So pregnancy do's and don'ts for the regular pregnant woman or someone who maybe has pregnancy complications. So, you know, I bet you that one of the biggest things patients always ask you when they're early in pregnancy is what kind of vitamin they should take. So um, what do you have suggestions for that? Yeah, well, so I think I want, I wanted to, kind of go over these pregnancy do's and don'ts because I spent three extra years learning about all the really complex things, right? Like the lupus, the twins, all that stuff that maybe 2% of women need to know about. And yet 99% of women have questions about all this regular stuff. So um, it was really good to kind of review it because it was something that I, you know, you kind of like don't really focus too much on, but it actually is something that, like you mentioned, every single woman who is al pre already pregnant or is thinking about getting pregnant wants to know about. So I get asked about prenatal vitamins all the time. The short answer is they're all very good and whichever one you find over the counter is most likely gonna be sufficient for you. 
the whole thing about pregnancy is if you eat a well-balanced diet, you're most likely going to get everything you need. When you run into trouble is if you're actually deficient in anything. So there's nothing that you need supra therapeutic levels for. You just need to be at a normal level and not be too low in any specific vitamin. Nothing you need to consume in excess to be healthy. So the main things that all prenatal vitamins have is folic acid, which is important for the baby's uh, development of the baby's brain and spine. And luckily, in 1998, the FDA basically um, recognized that this was an issue. And so now a lot of foods, specifically grains, cereals, are already fortified with folic acid. Um, but that being said, having a prenatal vitamin that has 0.4 milligrams of folic acid in it is, is the recommendation. Um, the other thing that people ask about is vitamin D. So um, all people should take about 600 milli units of vitamin D. And most prenatal vitamins have that. So there's no extra amount of vitamin D that you need in pregnancy. 600 milli uh, units, which is international units, which is what everybody of normal adult age should be taking is what is recommended in pregnancy. Um, yeah, I, is I have a question. Do you yeah. get some of that vitamin D from the sun? So like maybe um, you worry more about patients in the Northeast than like in sunny Los Angeles? Yeah, that is definitely a good question. Um, so that you do absolutely get that from the skin, from your um, sun exposure for sure. Um, and but again, it's not you shouldn't. I wouldn't double up on your regular prenatal vitamin if you live in Providence, for example. Got it. Um, anemia. A lot of people ask about anemia in pregnancy, which is when you have low blood counts, and that is more common in pregnancy. In general. By definition, all pregnant women are a little bit more anemic when they're pregnant than when they're not. And so iron, um, which is a, a chemical that we have in our body, is pretty important. And so that one, that is quite common that we ask women to supplement with extra iron in pregnancy. Again, that's um, available in some prenatal vitamins, but that is one that we might ask the women to take in addition to their regular prenatal vitamin. If, they're hem if we find that they're more anemic than we think is safe. Um, and then the last thing that is important is calcium. So that one, um, we get a lot from our diet, so dairy foods, but not, um, not uh, to the point that uh, you, you wouldn't be, it wouldn't be beneficial to also have some in your prenatal vitamins. So calcium comes mostly from prenatal vitamin and supplementing with diet. I'm really happy that you said that, you know, patients don't need to run out and buy all these extra supplements. Cause I always have patients asking me before surgery or after they've been diagnosed with breast cancer, like, okay, now what supplement do I need to take? And it's actually like, no, I just want you to get lean proteins, keep exercising if that's what you do and make sure that you're getting enough veggies and not too many refined sugars. And it's just like, just normal stuff, you know, balanced diet. Everything in moderation. If you're going to do green or uh, vegetables, make sure that the dark vegetables, so dark leafy greens are the ones that have the most folate and, and all those goodies. Good. And what about vegetarians and vegans? Do they need anything special? So um, they can run into a little bit more trouble with protein. So as long as you have a good balanced diet with legumes, beans, um, uh, even tofu supplementing with some kind of protein, um, you should be completely fine with the vegetarian and vegan diet. Again, it's all about balance. Yeah. Okay. Speaking about balance, what about pregnancy weight gain? Like what's the right amount? Cause I, you hear about women, you know, gaining like 70 pounds and then some women gain no weight during pregnancy. So how do you counsel patients about that? Yeah, the first thing I look at is how much they weigh before they're pregnant. So if you are a normal, healthy BMI, body mass index weight, then recommendation is to gain about 30 pounds in your whole pregnancy. And um, the majority of that is in the second and third trimester. So women are often pretty nauseous in the first trimester and don't gain a ton in the beginning. Most of that weight gain comes along second and third trimester towards the end. If you are starting off obese, though, with the BMI greater than 30, we do recommend you gain a little bit less, so closer to like 15 pounds, so about half that. Um, and on the flip side, if you have twins, we, you should gain a little bit more, so closer to about 40 pounds. And this is important because if you don't gain enough weight in pregnancy, that can um, have effects on your baby not growing as well. And on the flip side, if you gain too much, your baby might be too big, and that puts you at risk for um, a C-section. So Gaining that 30 pounds if you're a normal weight is pretty important. 
Yeah, so bigger is not always better when it comes to babies. <laughs> you know, those cheeks are really cute, but <laughs> that's the problem. Okay, and um, so when you hear women say, I'm eating for two, <laughs> what is that the right way to do it? Um, if, if by two you mean that you live on 400 calories a day, then maybe, <laughs> but... So if your normal recommendation is 2,000 calories a day, please don't start consuming 4,000 calories a day. On average, you really only need an additional 400 calories a day when you're pregnant for that little extra two person, which is the fetus. So yeah. Yeah. Which is like a yogurt and a banana. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> mean protein. Oh, yeah. And protein. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Now what about wine. So this is probably going to be the most important question for me and anyone like me is, can you drink wine during pregnancy? Because I thought red wine is good for you. Can it, is it good for the baby too? Yes. Right. So if the French do it, it must be okay, right? So I get this. I ask this a lot. What we do know is that high amount of alcohol intake is associated with fatness. So it is associated with birth defects and with developmental delays in the child as its school age. What we don't know is how much is, if there is a safe limit for not a lot of usage. And the way they define small usage is less than seven drinks a week, which is actually quite a bit. So there have been studies that shown that less than seven drinks a week are not associated with anything, but they're not really well done studies. So we can't totally trust them. So the bottom line is because we don't know a safe limit of what that safe cutoff is, all the organizations, the governing doctor bodies uh, uh, groups basically are saying to avoid it altogether because we really don't have that safe, safe limit. If you had now, to be real, if you had one glass of wine before you knew you were pregnant or a celebratory glass of champagne, does that mean your kid's not going to go to Harvard? Probably not, but really we just don't know. Okay, well, that's kind of a bummer, but we'll move on. <laughs> so what about caffeine? Yeah, so we both probably have known other friends who were pregnant in residency and you know, I know you like coffee. Me personally, I like those monster rehab drinks because they're delicious and also have B vitamins and coconut water. <laughs> I'm looking for my sponsorship monster. But um, so when our colleagues are pregnant in residency or training and, you know, we usually have all this caffeine every day, like how do you tell patients that usually consume a lot of caffeine? Like, what do you tell them to do? So I have good news for caffeine. So we think caffeine is probably as good. Yeah, so, so maybe not as much as the wine, you can switch that up for the coffee. So, so um, we know that high amounts, and by high, I mean more than like 10 cups a day. So you really gotta be jugging it down, um, is associated slightly with a high risk of miscarriage. So don't be having 10 cups a day, but really if you have, if you limit to about 20 ounces or a venti Starbucks or, you know, really about, something the size of this a day is completely safe um, and not associated with any risk. So go ahead, 20 ounces of caffeine a day, whether that's um, you know Coke or soda products or coffee is completely fine and you can have sweetener with it. There's no risks associated with that. So drink away. By Coke, you mean Coca-Cola and not cocaine, right? <laughs> that's what I meant. <laughs> Just clarifying for our listeners. Um, I had another question about this, uh, caffeine. Oh, you know what I used to tell patients? Cause okay. When they be, find out they're pregnant, if there's someone who is drinking like multiple cups of coffee a day and all of a sudden they stop drinking caffeine, they'll get all of these headaches. And so I would say, okay, you know, like you said, moderation, it's okay to have one or, you know, one or two cups a day. And especially if you're someone who drank a lot of caffeine before stopping all of a sudden can cause some pretty significant headaches. So yeah, you're absolutely right. And in fact, caffeine is a treatment that we use for women who have headaches. So definitely. Yeah. Okay. So you live in Los Angeles and probably like to eat a lot of sushi if you are like, I remember you. And so what do you tell patients who are pregnant about fish and sushi? Yeah, I get asked this a lot. So there's good and bad to the fish dilemma. So the good is you want 
to have omega-3 fatty acids and you want to have DHA, which is docosuhexaonic acid. Those are two good fats that you want in pregnancy. They're really good for the baby's brain development and fish have them. What fish can also have is mercury. So that's what gets a bad rap. So mercury is an element and it's a metal and we too much of that can be actually toxic to the baby's brain. So when you pick your fish, you want to have the fish that are high in omega-3 fatty acids or DHA, but low in mercury. So good choices are salmon, uh, snapper, trout, uh, oysters are good, um, anchovies, uh huh. Um, you can, and then the most important one that people ask about is tuna. So light canned tuna is good. The tuna you do not want to have is big eye tuna, which I don't even know what that is. I've never even heard of that. But the normal tuna that you have in tuna salad or in sushi is, is fine. Um, and so the recommendation is to have about two to three servings of fish a week of this like salmon, trout, tuna variety. Um, what you don't want to have is you don't want to have the big fish that eat a lot of the little fish. So the predator fish. You don't want to have shark, which who eats shark unless you live in Iceland. Um, and like king mackerel, um, marlin. So like a lot and swordfish, I think is probably the one that maybe people, some people have heard about. So you don't want to have those big aggressive predator fish, but most of the fish that we have is fine. Um, so, so that's the fish story. So then back to the cooked or raw. So the issue with raw fish is really just about getting a, a parasite. So it's like your standard food poisoning. So yes, nobody wants that, but it's honestly not dangerous. You're just gonna get a GI bug. And the bottom line is if you are getting like sushi grade fish in the States, that's a trusted restaurant or, or fish market, you're probably fine. I would probably not have sushi on the street corner in Southeast Asia or something, you know? But so, um, so sushi and fish are, are fine. I, I support it for my patients. So sushi in Tijuana is a no-go, but sushi at <laughs> Nobu is probably okay. You got it, exactly. <laughs> right, and um, to, I, what I was wondering is like how much, how, how much is an ounce of sushi, like a roll of sushi? Like how many ounces of that? Like we're like supposed to have two to three servings. So about five rolls is how much sushi you need for a whole week. So oh, that's a lot. Yeah. So if you go twice a week and you have like two or three rolls at dinner, that's the perfect amount. Okay. Good to know. So I guess pregnancy won't be that depressing. Um, right. <laughs> no what problem. about... <laughs> what about cheeses? So I hear that you can't eat certain types of cheese. Yeah, cheeses. Um, so the, the ones that get a bad rap is unpasteurized cheeses. So a pasteurized just means that they heated it to a really, really high temperature. And so a lot of the bacteria that thrives on soft cheeses gets, you know, burned away. Um, so you, the reality is that most cheeses in the United States are pasteurized. So the, you might run into risks again into like small specialty boutique cheese shops that make their own cheese on site, for example, or some, or like a, you know, a farmhouse or something, but, but most cheeses are pasteurized. So you should just read the label and make sure that it is. Um, and the other thing is that hard cheeses. So if you think about your, um, like on pasture, or like really firm, like, um, Parmesan or Gouda, those kinds of things, even if they're not pasteurized. The hard cheeses are um, basically the way they're produced for such a long period of time that they're aged and that the bacteria goes away on its own as well. So as long as it's pasteurized or aged, you're most likely fine. And if you really want to be doubly careful, you get ones that are pasteurized and aged. So that would be like your aged Gouda, uh, Manchego. I know you like your Manchego. You are married to a Spaniard, <laughs> uh, Parmesan and cheddar. Um, the other thing that can, so then why we worry about the cheeses is something called listeria. And so listeria is um, a bacteria that got um, known for growing in soft cheeses, soft unpasteurized cheeses. But what we found is that even if it's pasteurized, they can, it can be cross contaminant from the deli equipment. So it can have, it can um, grow on the cheese even after it's already been pasteurized just by sitting on the, on the cheese grater or so. So really the, one of the safest things you can do is to buy cheese 
um, intact or not pre not cut at the using the equipment at the deli. Okay, like what about I hope I don't get sued for this. So like if you can you go to a subway and get a sandwich there or so you just like make all your sandwiches at home. No, no, I think that's fine. I think a lot of um, I mean, I think well, the more processed it is, the less likely it's it's going to have listeria. So it really grows, I think, in more of the um, unprocessed, kind of the fresh one, the one that you might be craving, you know, mm -hmm. French novelty cheese stores. Um, but the but what can happen is there can be outbreaks of listeria in, um, you know, something like a Subway, like a mass-produced amount of lettuce or even deli meats or cheeses. So, um, you know, why don't you have a little alert on your phone? And so if you know about any listeria outbreaks in your area, you can avoid those places. <laughs> Yeah, I wonder if Siri can coordinate that for you. That would be a great app. I'm sure maybe some pregnancy app has it. Yeah. Oh, you know what population is at risk, though? And this is worth highlighting. Queso fresco. I was just going to ask about the cheese that goes on ta those cute little tacos. Yeah. So for the Hispanic population or everybody who really loves their queso fresco, you got to be careful with that one. Because... Um, and they've actually studied this and they have shown that Hispanic women are like three times more likely to get listeriosis, which is the infection of listeria um, among all pregnant women. So, and, and they think it's probably from how delicious and wonderful queso fresco is, so, but you gotta be careful. It, it does come pasteurized, you just gotta read the labels. Okay, good to know, good to know. Who knew that by doing a maternal fetal medicine fellowship, you'd also become such a food expert? <laughs> Maybe you should have a food blog for pregnant women. <laughs> oh my God. Yes. That's a great idea. <laughs> That'd be fun. You should help me with that. You were always much better at the pick in the restaurants than I was. <laughs> yeah. I can pick a restaurant, but when it comes to cooking, as long as you don't over salt it, you're pretty good. Oh my gosh. That means I'm in love. <laughs> that's the Russian old wives tale. A little <laughs> salt over the shoulder. <laughs> yeah. So uh, Dr. Plume used to be Dr. Dotkeva and is of Russian Tajikistan descent, Tajik, 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 mm -hmm. and she likes really salty foods and specifically things that come in cans. Um, and she kind of caters everything. Well, she's an excellent cook. She does cater all of her foods to her salty taste. So just in case she ever invites you over for dinner at her house. Oh my gosh, I just bought a, I found a really amazing little Russian deli down the street and I, I was very excited to get my pickled herring. I haven't had that in a long time. <laughs> so weird. I did, tr I'll try anything once, you know. Um, so moving away from food, um, let's talk about smoking, uh, toking it up with the marijuana or just rip and sig or vaping. Tell us everything because that's probably yeah. a bigger deal now. Yeah, it's bad. Don't do it. You got that's that's what I'm pretty firm on with my patients. Really, really spend a lot of time counseling because smoking is bad for many reasons, not just mom's health and lung cancer and heart disease and all that, but but it really does affect the baby. Um, so it can cause the babies to be really small. Um, it can cause them to to not grow normally. It can um, put you at risk for delivering premature. Um, and then they get jittery when they're born. They're like, you know, they're withdrawal from the nicotine. So, so smoking is, 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 we really encourage women. And you know what I found? Pregnant women are so motivated. It is one of the only times in your life that you truly feel responsible for another human being. And I have found that women have more courage and are more motivated in pregnancy than any other time in their life. So if there's ever the, if you need the willpower to do something, you will get it in pregnancy. So that's one of my favorite parts of my job is how freaking motivated women can get. And I love that. But, um, that just maybe. gave me the goosebumps. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so great. I think yeah. that, um, would you say the same for, you know, women who maybe haven't been doing a great job controlling their diabetes? Yeah, absolutely. Like women are just so motivated. You know, the majority, the majority just, they just find this like motivation and deep into their soul. And they just feel so responsible for bringing this human into the world that I've seen women lose weight in pregnancy, which, you know, you want to be careful with that, but um, quit their bad habits. I've seen women get clean off of drugs. I've seen women, you know, fix their blood pressure issues. It's, it's pretty remarkable. 
Yeah. Speaking of drugs, what do you tell patients, you know, with the opioid crisis? So if a patient's taking chronic opioids, how do you usually manage those patients? So um, the recommendation now is to actually go on um, opiate. If you have opiate use disorder, so you're you're really taking it daily quite a bit amount to actually go on medication assisted treatment or MAT. And that is actually um, switching out the opiates, whether it's heroin or Percocets or oxycodones for something like methadone or buprenorphine, which I just got my buprenorphine license. So I'm now an official um, subscriber. So anybody in the LA area, if you know somebody, <laughs> shameless plug. Um, but it is important that we, we don't want women to just completely quit cold turkey unless they're very motivated just because the rates of relapse are pretty high. So it's actually better to stay on one of these like doctor approved opiates to get you through pregnancy on a safe amount of opiates, keep you clean, not, not um, relapsing. And um, while babies can be addicted a little bit to the opiates when they're born, it's much shorter long period of time if you're on one of these mat treatments than on the you know um, illegal drugs. Or Good illegal to know. Drugs. Good to know. Yeah. Or legally prescribed drugs that patients are just dependent on. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. You know, when I went to medical school at Parkland, UT Southwestern, I don't know if they're still doing this, but when I was a medical student, they offered women uh, detox therapy, like admission to the hospital where they would detox and then they would taper down their methadone daily by giving them different doses hidden in their orange juice. So the patient would never know if they were being tapered down that day or not, or if they were on like the same dose they got the day before. And um, the reason, and, and I remember looking this up, like we used to think that, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, Alina, but we used to think that the withdrawal aspect would like stress out the fetus, but that's not so much the risk. The risk is more quitting cold turkey and then relapsing maybe and having a higher dose than you did before, and which is how a lot of overdoses happen or the other risky behaviors associated with relapse, which include, you know, being exposed to different um, issues like hep C, et cetera. Is that how we think about it still? Yeah, you are 100% correct. We used to think that <clears throat> withdrawing, quitting cold turkey would cause something called an abruption or you, you know, the complications in the pregnancy. That's actually not proven. Um, but what we worry about is just a really high rate of relapse. So you, you nailed it. That's absolutely right. What about vaping? Is there a special risk for vaping? Don't vape. Don't vape. It has more nicotine than cigarettes. Yes, you, it seems safer because there's not smoking in the air or, or fumes in the air, but it actually has a higher amount of nicotine and is um, it's pretty still new. We're still getting information, but the information that we are getting is it has the same risks as classic cigarette tobacco. Okay, so now that marijuana is legalized in a bunch of states, how do you counsel patients that smoke marijuana or edibles? Yeah, um, ooh, edibles, that's a good one. So, so let me start with the smoking. So the, the, the THC, which is the actual chemical in marijuana, has been shown to cause developmental delay mm -hmm. issues in children. We do not know a safe amount so it's a little bit like the alcohol dilemma. We, all the societies recommend to not do it in pregnancy. I can't tell you if it's one joint a day or one joint a trimester, of which amount, but in general, the recommendation is to avoid marijuana altogether in pregnancy. Um, edibles, I actually have not looked into it. Um, I'm assuming that it's probably a little bit better because you don't have the smoke effect of it, but uh, I'm assuming that the THC is probably, it's still a chemical. It's actually a very small um, lipophilic chemical, we call it, meaning it's something that definitely crosses the placenta and very easily crosses um, into the baby's brain. So that's why we think it causes so much of the neurodevelopmental delays. So avoid. So if it, it makes it you... The pregnancy don't. <laughs> pregnancy don't. <laughs> I should have like a big X that comes up when you say that. Yeah. So if it, makes, if it makes you feel stupid, it might also make your fetus feel stupid. Totally. That's the thing. <laughs> if you feel drunk, if you feel high, your baby's high. <laughs> <laughs> Wise words, doctor. Okay. What about exercise? Because like exercise is good, but 
everyone's afraid. So tell us what the deal with exercise is. Yeah, pregnancy. pregnancy is an exercise do. So do in the safe amount. So whatever you've been doing before you were pregnant, if you were, if you ran marathons before you were pregnant, you can probably continue, honestly. So it's whatever you were already conditioned. If you have been doing your Peloton every day and you feel good, you can keep doing that in pregnancy. I would never start a new regimen that you are not already accustomed to in pregnancy. So in general, we recommend exercise, aerobic, some strength training, pregnancy yoga, whatever you want, several couple times a week is always really good. Keeps you um, what your weight appropriate weight goals. Um, it makes the labor easier, lower risk, lower rates of C-section if you exercise in pregnancy. So, so the exercise is good. I would avoid um, high contact things. So I probably wouldn't do like kickboxing <laughs> or um, horseback riding, anything at risk of you injuring yourself, I would avoid. Downhill skiing? Um, I would avoid, if you, if you are like an Olympic skier and you've never fallen in 10 years, you're probably okay, but I would avoid. The other thing that is important is your balance is going to be off, especially as you get bigger with your giant growing belly. So your equilibrium is off. So, I mean, I have had women who continue doing, you know, ballet and bar classes because they're just have amazing posture. But, but again, it's all about uh, moderation and knowing what you are comfortable, what you have already been doing. Generally speaking, you can continue in pregnancy. Now, with the caveat, if your doctor says no exercise because you've had some complication or bleeding in pregnancy, you know, this is all, I'll uh, speak to your doctor first. Yeah, and along that same line, what about sex during pregnancy? By and large, sex is fine. Um, we encourage it as long as your doctor has not told you not to, because there are some conditions that we say not to, especially if you've had some bleeding in pregnancy. But by and large, we encourage women and partners to, um, that that is a do in pregnancy, as long as your doctor says it's safe. In fact, it is one of the best ways to get your body into labor. So if you are 41 weeks and you are overdue and you are trying to get the baby out, I would do some nipple stimulation and have some sex. Yeah. One of my residents at my last job asked me that, like, and I was like, well, the easiest way to get to get into labor is to have sex. There are prostaglandins in semen. And that's all right. My listeners may be totally grossed out, but hey, science. <laughs> exactly. What about um, things like uh, wearing a seatbelt? Oh, definitely do, do. Some people worry that it's going to actually be harmful to their belly. So um, I would, I would, I would um, uh, move it so it's underneath the belly, not like kind of on top, just kind of slide it down, but definitely use it. And getting my hair colored. Hair dye is fine. Yep, hair dye is fine. Um, they've even looked at um, uh, cosmetologists uh, who have a ton of extra hair dye exposure and there's no risks of birth defects or any kind of fume concerns, anything like that. So color away, girl. Okay, good to know because I'm pro hair color. Uh, actually, I was talking to my mom the other day and she was like, when, you know, with all these advances in science, when are they actually going to give you like a pill to prevent gray hair. And I was like, hopefully soon, because yeah. no, <laughs> learning no gray is so expensive. For it. I know, not, money can't even buy a long-term fix for it. <laughs> no. Okay, one more thing, finally. Not like everyone's doing a ton of traveling right now, but what about traveling uh, and pregnancy? Um, yeah, I, I, I'm fine with women um, flying up until like 35, 36 weeks. Um, if they're not at risk, again, talk to your doctor about it. It's a little bit individualized. If you've been having a lot of pain and contractions, you probably shouldn't be getting onto a plane. Um, but yeah, generally up until 35, 36 weeks, I'm okay with women flying. Um, if you are going to fly, I would say to walk around on the plane a lot, stretch out your legs um, you're, so you're not too sitting down for too long because that can increase your risk of blood clots in your legs. And similarly, if you're on a long cross-country road, cross, cross country road trip or something, just to get, have a lot of stops and get out and move, and move your car a lot. But um, there's no risks of um, airplane travel, like radiation exposure from being up in the sky. None of that is, is, is to, be, to be concerned about. It's very safe. And then do you have any advice for women who are pregnant during the pandemic? 
like, should they get their flu shot? What should they do? Oh boy, yeah. The pandemic and pregnancy has, has been a hot topic, obviously. Um, yes, flu shot is very important. Um, uh, normal contact precaution things. So normal social distancing, staying six feet away, washing your hands, all of that still applies. We do know that in general, pregnant women are probably at higher risk for getting sick with COVID compared to non-pregnant women. Um, so just gotta be careful. And with any symptoms, I would say talk to your doctor and just get a test sooner rather than later. Um, the good news is though, while there have been like a handful of case reports of the COVID getting to the baby, by and large, when you look at the you know hundreds and thousands of pregnant women who've had COVID at this point, the amount of times that the baby gets it is exceedingly rare. So while it has happened a handful of times, it's very, very rare and women should not be worried about the baby. They should just be more worried about their own health. And is it safe for pregnant women to wear masks? Oh, yes. Well, they should. Have you heard that they... they no, can't? but some patients might think that. And so maybe we should just reaffirm that for everyone. Oh, yeah. I guess, I guess if you're worried that you're not going to you're going to breathe in your own carbon monoxide. Or Which is not a real thing. Not we all thing. know our colleagues who are super pregnant, who spend hours in the OR with masks on, and their babies turn out to go to really good colleges. And so it's going to be fine. Wear your mask. Please right? wear a mask. Please, yeah. please, please wear a mask. Definitely. Okay. Thank you so much for giving us all this helpful information. I know that pregnancy can be a stressful time for a lot of women and now like even more so. So they got all this free advice from you. Thank you for your oh time gosh. and expertise. It's been so fun. I hope women <laughs> feel a little bit reassured about the do's and the don'ts and, you know, talk to your doctor about everything again. Like, you know, don't consider this pure medical advice. Talk to your doctor about any specific, your specific situation. Definitely. Yeah. Good point. As I always put a disclaimer at the end of this podcast that this is not medical advice from us, but these are just general recommendations and it's always super important to talk to your own doctor. But lastly, before we close, um, you know, when I had Jenna Emerson, uh, GYN oncology uh, extraordinaire on for episode one, I made her tell me, um, you know, her favorite story from residency. So what's yours? But I have to be in it, obviously. <laughs> Hmm. Oh my gosh, there's been so many. We had like four amazing years in the trenches at work, at home, everything. There's just, there's so many. I think, um, Kristen, I've, I love living with you so much. You are just the light at the end of my day. The fact that we could come home and make our Hello Fresh meals every day with a glass of wine and just, you know, vent was kind of the it's the it's the everyday activity that on a whole was probably my favorite part about residency yeah it was awesome living with you and i didn't even pay you to say that on my podcast so or maybe you'll ask me for a reimbursement later but <laughs> you know what you know what my specific my favorite memory is i i got it my favorite memory was being your and jorge's mm -hmm. witness as you got married in our living room in front of a Prada poster, <laughs> which is right there. Right there. <laughs> I know. So uh, with what was his name? Trey? Troy? No. Uh, our justice of the peace that we got off thumbtack.com. Uh, yeah. I don't remember his name, but. Um, it was a sweet little seven minute ceremony uh, with uh, close friends only, last minute. Um, I am the product of a 90 day fiance marriage. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding, I actually knew Jorge for a very long time, but we did get married on the 90 day fiance visa. So we did, we're running out of time. So that uh, was the most beautiful ceremony I've ever been to. <laughs> oh my gosh, I'm like blushing. Yeah, we didn't even have pictures or anything. I think my mom just recently received a photo um, from that day uh, that was actually quite stressful. I remember being like really, really sweaty because I was so nervous. Well, listen, you set the trend. That's what people are doing now with COVID. So you were yeah. the- you were Hey, the we're still married, so. <laughs> 
just because you can't have the wedding you always dreamed of doesn't mean that uh, your marriage won't be solid. So well, you guys are solid. I lived with both of you for three years. You guys are solid. <laughs> Oh my gosh, Alina, it's been so nice having you. Uh, let me just give you a shameless plug. So anyone who's in the Los Angeles area, um, Dr. Plume works at UCLA. She's a maternal fetal medicine attending there. She does research on ultrasound and what else? Um, your general research folks? Depression, opiates, substance use, um, uh, mental health disorders in pregnancy. I've been doing some artificial intelligence with ultrasound, so the devil. Yeah, so obviously brilliant and an excellent doctor. And um, so all of you guys, you know, should check her out. She's also on Instagram. Tell us your uh, professional social media handles. Um, so my professional one is, is on Twitter. So Alina, oh, I-L-I-N-A-M-D, Alina M-D. Just Alina M-D? Yeah, I'm the only Alina. Oh my God. <laughs> How much did you have to pay to get that one? <laughs> uh, a, thanks, thank my sister for picking a unique spelling of my name, I guess. Yeah. That's amazing. So at Alina MD on Twitter for to follow what she's up to. And if you live in the LA area and you also see patients for with, who have complicated medical question problems for preconception counseling as well. Yeah, absolutely. That's one of the most important things is to tee up all your health issues before you get pregnant. Yeah. So Alina or Dr. Plume can also see you in that context as well. So thank you everyone for tuning in. Thank you, doctor, for being here. It's been good to see you virtually and hopefully we see each other soon and bye everyone. Thank you. Girl. Thank you. <laughs>